थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन सो माई सेल्फ डॉक्टर रत्नाकर टूडे आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक ऑन टू इम्पोर्टेंट टॉपिक्स दैट इज फ्लेक्शन डिफॉर्मिटीज एंड रिकर्वेटम इन टोटली ऑर्थोप्लास्टी फर्स्टली आई विल स्टार्ट विद द फ्लेक्शन डिफॉर्म Yeah, let me give the introduction, Pratnagar. Sir, yeah, uh, fellows, you all got to be very, 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 very sensitive to this today's topics. Both are equally demanding. Flexion deformity is uh, initially. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, sir. We can, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, flexion deformity is very daunting. Sometimes very intimidating. Um, flexion deformities are quite common. Not very uncommon in Indian setup. And at the same time, recurvatum is the voice. Voice is breaking. Uh, sir, your voice is not clear, sir. Can't hear you. Yeah, I'll call him and tell him. Yeah. Don't have the answers for recurvatum. Hello, uh, sir. We couldn't hear you in last one Can't minute. Can't hear me. Oh, okay. Don't worry. Start. I'll move to other place. Okay. Yeah. yeah let it. Let him start. Kushal. Let him start. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, management of flexion deformities during TKR. like uh, guru reddy sir was telling that this is one of the very important deformities it can be uh, seen as an isolated deformity or it can be associated with a combination of varus or valgus deformities too so why is this important because uh, these are often challenging and achieving a balanced flexion and extension gap without any residual deformity will give you a better functional outcomes so there are various etiologies which are proposed for this flexion deformity so patients with a rheumatoid or an osteoarthritis because of the raised intraarticular pressure secondary to the inflammation the knee joint will achieve the flexion uh, posture leading to flexion contracture secondary because of the formation of the posterior osteophytes there will be tenting of the posterior capsule and persistently uh, contracted posterior capsule will take the flexion contracture or it could be because of the mechanical block on the anterior aspect uh, called as anvil osteophytes so this will give a mechanical block and prevent into a complete extension no in uh, flexion contracture usually we see there is a contracture of the pcl the posterior capsule the posterior oblique ligament and in a very severe deformities you see the contracture of the gastrocnemius and hamstrings also uh the medial collateral is also uh contracted so like i said it can be associated with the varus knees where you see the pc uh, the posterior capsule uh, pol and the semi membranous uh, contracted in valgus knees you see the popliteo fibular ligament contracted and very severe cases the gastrocnemius and the hamstrings are contracted now why is it important like i said your quadriceps is usually contracting every movement to keep uh, uh, to prevent you from buckling so whenever you attain a flexion contracture your quadriceps has to work more in order to maintain your uh, knee joint stable so there will be increased energy uh, consumption at the same time a prolonged flexion contracture can accelerate the arthritic changes in the contralateral limb it can lead to the long term spino pelvic or ipsilateral hip uh, ipsilateral and contralateral hip problems so it is proved that if a patient is having bilateral flexion contractures of more than 30 degrees your quadriceps must have uh, must be acting almost double the time uh, to keep the knee joint stable now when you get the patients with uh, flexion contracture pre operative evaluation is very important we need to get a proper x rays so your x rays should be parallel to the tibial plateau surface uh, to get a proper ap view at the same time a thorough clinical neurological and vascular examination is important now there are different gradings proposed again from different papers some papers says grade 1 is something less than 10 degrees 
while some paper says less than 15 degrees as a mild deformity in few papers it is uh, 10 to 20 or 15 to 30 degrees and anything more than 30 degrees is considered to be a severe uh, flexion deformity uh, now how can you correct this flexion deformity it can be done preoperatively during the surgery and postoperatively also you can get it correct correction or maintain the correction now uh, coming to the preoperative uh, uh, correction of flexion deformities it is usually not required in mild to moderate deformities these deformities usually after the spinal anesthesia gets corrected and you don't require any uh, any any uh, new steps for this uh, this type of patient but patients with a severe flexion deformities of more than 30 degrees you may require a serial casting skeletal traction or ELISA assisted correction of the flexion deformity why is this preoperative correction important only to reduce the amount of the deformity you need to deal intraoperatively it will help in that manner so uh, you need uh, soft tissue as well as the bony correction for uh, achieving a balanced flexion and extension gaps in flexion deformities uh, measured dissection technique is considered to be the standard when you, you want when you want to deal with these type of uh, deformities so these patients will have like i said posterior tight structures then flexion gap is usually normal but the extension gap is very thin so it's not like the flexion gap is loose with respect to a normal flexion gap your extension gap is tight so when you deal uh, with the correction of these patients and the first step is sacrifice your PCL. The moment you sacrifice your PCL, some amount of contraction and some amount of the tightness in both flexion and extension will get corrected. Then you need to release the posterior osteophytes and you need to release the posterior capsule. If possible, do a Runsal maneuver, sublux your tibia anteriorly completely, remove the uh, osteophytes on the medial and the posterior aspects and uh, uh, release uh, some amount of the medial uh, MCL. So this will help you uh, a lot in correction of your flexion deformities. Now, uh, I just want to show in this video about this anterior anvil osteophytes, which could be a reason for your mechanical block in flexion. So you can see with an electrocautery, I'm pointing out towards an anvil osteophyte. So when I try to extend the knee, it hinges over the uh, distal femur and prevents from complete uh, extension. So the moment you remove that anvil osteophyte, you can achieve complete extension. So this video, I want to show you how to address the posterior osteophytes and posterior capsular release. So uh, here you can see uh, with the electrocautery, I'm pointing out the posterior cartilage line then you need to use a sharp and a curved osteotome, osteotome and remove the posterior osteophyte. At the same time, you try to uh, scrape it against the posterior uh, condyle to release the posterior capsular area. So, uh, so the, the, this particular demonstration was in a measured resection technique. We also can uh, do this posterior osteophyte removal during a gap balancing technique. So on the left side, you can see an instrument which is used to put in the intramedullary canal of the femur. So you can lift the femur, uh, femur with, the, with this particular instrument and the traction is given on the tibia. So you get a lot of access on the posterior aspect of the femur and you can again use your curved osteotome to remove your posterior capsule, uh, osteotome at the same time release that posterior capsule. So, so once you clear the posterior recess, that is the junction between the posterior shaft as well as the distal femur, your flexion contracture will get corrected. In severe deformities only you will require a posterior capsulotomy. To do a posterior capsulotomy, you need to have a laminar spreaders. You need to keep your knee joint better in an extension and use an electrocautery and uh, uh, the thickened posterior capsule, you can just incise it away from the midline. Always try to use your soft tissue uh, corrections prior to revision of the bony cuts. 
in spite of uh, doing all the osteophyte removal posterior capsular release medial uh, uh, mcl release if you are still not able to attain your uh, uh, correction then you need to go for a revision of your distal femur cut so it is said that every 2 mm additional distal femur cut can uh, correct your flexion deformity by 10 to 15 degrees maximum you can go up to 13 to 14 uh, mm of the distal femur cut beyond 13 to 14 mm of distal femur cut two things can happen one is there could be strain on your collaterals second thing there could be elevation of your joint line leading to patella baja so this particular video uh, i am just showing after completing all the four cuts your flexion contracture is not at corrected you want to revise your distal femur cut so you can just go through this video Lantaka, the video audio is not coming. Uh, what you should stop. do? Is yeah. Stop sharing. Audio is not clear. Yeah, you can only hear it from your speaker. What you can do is stop sharing. When you start sharing screen, you'll have an option share sound as well in the bottom left hand corner. Start sharing again. When it says uh, that option, you'll get right uh, share screen or share PPT and all that. in the bottom left hand corner you have a box which says share audio now we'll be able to hear it are you able to hear dr arish dr arish yeah did you click on that yeah okay now play once or you can just speak over it No, can't hear it. You, you speak can, over it. You okay. can explain rather. Maybe your right. or your laptop audio may be low. Well, anyway, you can speak over. Yeah. Ah, okay. I'll restart this video and start uh, explaining once again. You explain the steps. So, uh, just I wanted to show you Stop. revision of the distal femur cut in this video. so sometimes it is possible for you to identify the pin sites which you used for your distal uh, preliminary distal femur cut if you are able to identify that area just you can place the pins and then you can apply your distal femur resection block and then you can uh, just uh, shift it to plus 2 mm and then take the distal femur cut but it's not always possible to identify that pin pin sites so what i am doing here is this is a distal femur resection block i have just placed it on the anterior aspect of the femur shaft then i am taking two blades these two blades i will pass through the resection slot which i used initially to cut my distal femur cut and flush it into the distal femur cut area you ask your assistant to stabilize these both blades and anterior you anteriorly you stabilize this uh, distal femur cutting jig and then place your pins at the initial cutting uh, uh, the, the, the the site which you used initially that is 0 mm 0 so i'm placing my uh, both the pins medial and the lateral pins the blade blades are completely flush to the distal cutting area now you can take off your blades the jig is into place so it is for the previous cut preliminary cut whatever distal femur cut you have taken now you just remove this one and slide it distally or proximally depending on what you want to increase or decrease your cut so here i have taken plus 2 you can see the marking there plus 2 so that will give you an additional 2 mm of distal femur cut So this video, uh, yeah.
so you can see that is another 2 mm of distal femur cut which i can take after i slide the uh, resection block so once i uh, revise my distal femur cut i need to revise my chamfers also then only the matching of the femoral component will be good so this is called as free chamfer jig so this free chamfer jigs we have to place in the slot which are used for sizing the femoral component you can see the two holes there which are used for sizing once this is kept in place then you can just do from the anterior and the posterior aspect of the free uh, the free chamfer jig so that will revise the additional amount of the chamfer cuts so what are the accepted corrections in osteoarthritis on table i would don't like to have any sort of residual deformity why in case of inflammatory arthritis we follow this uh, rule called as uh, rule of 1/3 where you divide your total deformity into 3 thirds that is the one third first one third should be corrected preoperatively the second one third should be corrected intraoperatively and the residual one third should be corrected post operatively so in osteoarthritis the full correction of flexion contracture should be attempted at the time of surgical intervention as the best chance of correction may only be obtained at the time of surgery so this is a algorithm for correction of various deformities in case of mild deformities just you need to remove your medial and posterior osteophytes and release your posterior medial soft tissues this should be able to attain your correction in mild deformities with this if you are not able to correct your deformity then go for posterior capsular release either from the femur or the tibial side in case of a moderate deformities of 15 to 30 degrees you follow the above steps you have to revise your distal femur by 2 mm often you may require to pie crust your mcl and achieve the corrections only in case of severe deformities above 30 degrees revise your distal femur cut maximum up to 4 to 5 mm uh, you, you have to release your gastrocnemius from both the medial and the lateral side and always keep constrained implants rarely you may require to use medial epicondylar osteotomy so once your flexion and extension are completely uh, balanced you need to uh, when when you go for closure you have to advance your uh, uh, vmo distally and laterally for a adequate capsular closure and patella bah is one of the complication which you expect with uh, severe deformities of uh, uh, flexion deformities because of revision of your distal femur cut again and again so you have to resist with uh, the additional distal femur resection use other measures like you use on the tibial side and oversize the femur component like i said see in uh, flexion deformities your flexion gap is normal your extension <coughs> gap is tight so whenever you are getting in between sizes in an anterior referencing system you always choose to upsize your femoral component by upsizing your femoral component you make a normal flexion gap to a tighter flexion gap and then you use a thinner poly uh, to match the extension gaps and post operative protocols so uh, always you need to avoid keeping any pillow under the knee joint if possible keep a roll or a pillow under the ankle joint you uh, prevent recurrence of the flexion deformity by using the knee brace at night times sometimes the placing a trochanter roll uh, helps in keeping the limb into external rotated there are certain other measures which will help uh, in correction uh, and ratnagar sorry can i just interrupt you sorry yeah you go to the previous yeah the post up rehab see the picture on the top that he has put over here that is a very very useful uh, way to do it very important way that pillow which you can see he has put it horizontally okay and under the calf the reason for that is two reasons one it should not be below the knee joint 
so you avoid that uh, flexion contracture and it helps to stretch it out and also you leave the heel free because sometimes these patients get a lot of heel pain so in between if you put it just under the calf with a horizontal pillow that's the best way to do it so just a very simple thing but a, a nice demonstration of that there so you need to educate your patients completely that achieving your flex uh, extension is as important as achieving the flexion sometimes shoe lift on the contralateral side uh, this will help in lengthening the contralateral limb and uh, operative leg will be forced to extend while walking use of stationary bicycle with a seat place higher will also force the knee to come into extension on the down stroke and uh, also do a regular follow up of these patients so after this i have got three uh, case which are done in sunshine hospitals so this is an young lady with a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis she presented at the age of 22 she had a severe flexion contracture of both the limbs and she had multiple other deformities in the hand wrist thumb elbow she has got neck stiffness so you can see this one walking video of this patient this is an x ray showing a severe flexion contracture so this is a deformity she was having almost 45 degrees on the right side and 50 degrees on the left side with further restriction in the flexion also so what we did is uh, we did pre operative correction of the flexion contracture by applying elizaro rings on both the sides we got gradual distraction and over 6 to 8 weeks we got the flexion contracture corrected we, we took off the fixator after 3 months then uh, after removal of the fixator some amount of extension lag was there for which we used to give the long knee brace in spite of this patient was having persistent pain on weight bearing so the decision was taken to go for bilateral knee replacement so you we used a uh, uh, gap balancing technique buccal papas and uh, we with extension rods on the either sides because of very very poor osteoporotic bone quality we had to use the rods on both the sides so this is a patient at uh, one year follow up her gait has significantly improved so that was a case one one more patient uh, came to us with uh, she was wheelchair bound with flexion deformity of 40 degrees uh, rom was again 40 to 60 degrees so this is after anesthesia showing almost 40 degrees of flexion deformity this is a pre operative x ray patient was a known case of rheumatoid arthritis but she was <laughs> never treated for that one so intraoperatively when we opened the joint there were severe amount of uh, intraarticular patellofemoral adhesions and the parapatellar gutter was already filled with lot of fibro fatty tissue after removing, re removing the intraarticular adhesions intraarticular adhesions and uh, clearing the gutter we were able to achieve the flexion of 90 degrees and in the end we got almost uh, a straight knee so this is a post operative x ray so this is a last uh, third case uh, actually this uh, we did just 2 uh, to 3 days back only uh, robotic knee replacement for almost 35 degrees of flexion contracture so i am going to explain with this uh, only the pre operative planning and how uh, how we were able to correct it i am not going to uh, uh, details of the robotic knee replacement because that's a separate class for you so this is how we write a board for every patients the pre operative x ray showing almost flexion contracture the ct scan which is done for the robotic knees so you can see the osteophytes on the either aspect of the femoral condyle there is reduction 
of patellofemoral joint space. So there are osteophytes on the femur on the posterior aspect, on the posterior aspect of the tibia also. So this is a planning page where uh, the size of the femur is 5 and the size of the femur is 4. Uh, we were getting the size of the femur between 4 and 5 and like I previously explained, we always try to upsize femur component in uh, flexion deformities. So there are a lot of osteophytes on all aspects, on the anterior aspect, medial aspect, posterior aspect. So this is the patient's after the anesthesia, almost 35 degrees of flexion contact your patient is having. So this is after doing medial orthotomy, the patella which is having a lot of osteophytes. We, revive, uh, we, we Always it's better to do your patella first because it helps you to retract the patella away. So yeah, so the flexion patient was having ROM from 37 to 113. Uh, we were not able to capture the gaps. So what we did, we did a preliminary tibia cut initially. After doing a preliminary tibia cut, we were able to reach the posterior aspect and then take off the osteophytes. In spite of all these things, the flexion gap, the extension gap was too tight. So we had to revise the distal femur cut by 4.5 millimeter. After that, we were able to get, this is the final balancing what we got. The balanced gaps in both flexion and extension. Is some amount of flexion deformity for which I had to again go back, sublux and release uh, decently on the posterior aspect of the uh, uh, tibia. So this is the end. You can see the flexion which is very stable. Almost straight limb. <clears throat> so finally, our algorithm is remove the posterior osteophytes, release the posterior capsule and uh, sacrifice your PCL, do posterior capsulotomy and the gastroc uh, release if needed, revisit the digital femur cut, consider for a constrained implant whenever needed and emphasize on post-op rehab. Thank you. Shall I proceed to recurvatum or uh, shall we complete questions on flexion deformity? Any, I have questions on this question. Yeah. Different ball game. Yeah. Any questions on FFT, guys? Any precautions about peroneal nerve? Sheralatan's question. Yeah. Peroneal nerve. Is that the no, question? usually this uh, peroneal nerve will not be affected unless you have a severe flexion in valgus deformity with a valgus deformity. Only then we need to be careful about that one, and we need to avoid uh, using uh, your cautery between your uh, popliteus and the posterior lateral corner. One thing uh, you guys um, probably Ratnagar didn't really mention. It's a very rare thing. Boss will be able to elaborate on this. Severe FFD for very long-standing cases. Should be a little careful to straighten it out because sometimes there'll be a thrombus in the back. It may yeah. dislodge and cause an embolism. 
very very rare i don't think uh, i mean touch wood never seen it but uh, boss has had an incident in the past want to mention about that boss yeah last a patient <coughs> so he chronic <coughs> chronic patient with a fixed reflection contracture you have to continuously completely do the vascular tree um uh, evaluation and then only take it Sir, tips to prevent posterior uh, neurovascular injury while clearing the posterior osteophytes and capsular release. Basically, don't go in the midline. You just need to be uh, away from the midline. Yeah. And uh, when you use your cautery, make sure you use subperiosteally Sub rather than directly using on the posterior uh, soft tissues. Usually, very uh, rare to hit your posterior structures because when you flex the knee, they all they fall back. Okay. Right. So, if as long as you're not in the midline, you're usually safe. You don't have to worry too much about it. And as the boss mentioned in the previous uh, uh, class, when you're doing that release, use a cautery rather than a knife, because when you're using a cautery, you can, in case you're hitting any fibers, you'll see a twitch and you can immediately stop. But if you're hitting a nerve, you do. I mean, if you're using a knife, you'll never know. Just to one Is comment. Never, Tell me. Yes, sir. Vivian, sir. Ah, no, no. Only one or two small things. First of all, excellent demonstration, Radhakar. You have shown very well the video and also uh, talk yes, is sir. very good. Just one or two things which I would like to add is, uh, first of all, in general, such a gross deformities in general uh, thing will not come out. Usually, removal of the posterior osteophytes and capsular atomy, capsular, capsular release will make the knee straight. Very rarely or very occasionally a distal femoral cut has to be done. These are the algorithm which we have to follow. But such a deformity sometimes, actually Ratnakara has shown uh, a illusory type. So, uh, sometimes we can use other technique where, where we have five, six years back we have done in our institute only where mid lateral and mid medial incisions can be given and go to directly to the capsule and other contracted structures on the posterior side, release them from bony part and then we will get uh, here also, as he told very rightly, we should not aim at full correction of 180 degrees. If you get about 30 degrees, be happy. That 30 degrees can be managed during total knee. Actually, we have done like that, released it, and afterwards, uh, uh, we have done the total knee by cutting a little bit of distal cut. That, that is a combination. I mean, soft tissue release can be done. Actually, we were practicing this in a polio limbs, long back in limbs. Nothing will happen. And the incision problem also will not come. Usually, healing will be good. This is one thing. Second thing is regarding capsule atomy, one important point is we have to strip the capsule from posterior side of the femur, not just cutting. Of course, uh, if you are able to do with cautery, that is always good, but uh, you can strip with the help of uh, osteotome covered with mop. We can just strip it off uh, so that we'll, uh, correction will be coming. And we should know where we have to stop this and go for distal femoral cutting. As he told very nicely, the distal femoral cut is the last one, and after doing that, no further. If you follow this algorithm, usually I do you the, will do successfully. I, I do the distal femoral cut on the step one. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, quite convinced that it will make the operation much easier and faster. So I do it on the step one. But the classical teaching is... Uh, you go on the last. So it's a sergeant's size, sergeant's reference, yeah. and he is comforted. Yeah. yeah. I'll make one so, more point. Yeah. Ratnakar, I'm not sure if you mentioned that. Maybe I missed it. But um, so while we are focusing on the extension space and how to increase it, you can also work on the flexion space and ma make sure it is less because by nature, in a uh, flexion deformity knee, your flexion space is bigger than your extension space. So one is to increase the extension space. And the second thing to do is to ensure the flexion space doesn't increase too much. And yeah. one way to do that is to reduce the tibial slope. So while tibial different cut. companies have different slopes and even within that same company, there is a ability to increase or decrease the slope. Yes. Ensure that your slope is neutral. So take a zero degree block in a uh, PFC if you have it and take the zero de degree block and make sure even the alignment rod which goes down and you have the ability to increase the slope with the alignment rod make sure that is also 
uh, not adding more uh, degree of slope. So zero degree slope in all your, if you have that capability in your system, that way your flexion space doesn't open up much. Yeah. Point taken. Great. Shall we head to the Utica button? Everyone is okay with this? One more yeah. question, Aras. Yeah, One go ahead. more question is there. On table, leg is in full extension, but post-op even up to one month. Post-op, 15 degree extension leg, how to manage? Extension lag. Yeah, on table, there's a full extension. But post-op, even up to one month, post-op, 15 degrees extension lag, how to manage? Well, what was the preoperative deformity, whether it was a flexion deformity or uh, what, what sort of deformity? Oh, it must have been an FFD case. So he's saying that FFD 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 FFD. 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 20 degree FFD. 20 degree FFD. I mean, I would say definitely physiotherapy, 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 and nothing else. But first Maybe of all, you should identify between extensor lag and FFD. Yeah, there's a difference there between extensor lag and FFD. Okay, so if it is, probably if you noticed it earlier on, you can use that night sprint. Like you mentioned, you're basically long leg knee brace, keep it stretched out, slowly stretch out the posterior structures. That should help. You'll only see that situation if you're saying intraoperatively, you're getting full extension. But post-operative, we are in FFD. That means the posterior structures will be tied after the wears off. So if you can use your night sprints or your long leg knee brace, slowly it will stretch out. Okay. Thank you. But there was one more question about the patella, I think. We don't do resurfacing. We do patella plus. Oh, sorry. It's Kishore's answer. Sorry. I think we can go ahead then. Go ahead with the recovery. Yeah. So, recurvatum is again just again opposite to your flexion deformities. You know, recurvatum is operationally defined if the knee extension is more than 5 degrees. So, incidence reported is 0.5 to 1% in various uh, literature. But people using navigation has shown that it may, it may be as high as 3.5 to 11.8%. So, there is various etiology uh, proposed uh, related related to neuromuscular and non-neuromuscular reasons. Neuromuscular is most commonly the poliomyelitis, the myelopathies and hemiplegia. And there are various non-neuromuscular reasons like malunited, uh, tibia fractures, uh, ITB contractures, uh, growth, uh, growth plate injuries, and uh, maybe because of the cruciate or the collateral <laughs> ligament laxity in general to these patients. So pathoanatomy, there is a decreased posterior slope there is anterior sloping of tibia as a, uh, as what you see in a, a post HTO. And there is a significant wear or a bone loss on the anterolateral or the medial aspect of the tibial uh, plateau. The soft tissue is because of the overstretching of the posterior capsule. The knee attains hyperextension. And also there is associated collateral or the cruciate attenuation leading to this uh, hammock effect. So... Further on, if you uh, the ITB gets uh, contracted, the hyperextension can be further attenuated. So, uh, surgical tips is that the standard approach of medial parapatella. One thing we should keep in mind that whenever you deal with a recurvatum or a loose joint, all your cuts are going to be minimal. In uh, contrast to your flexion gap, where your extension gap was tighter than normal flexion gap, here, your extension gaps are very loose compared to your normal flexion gaps. So, when you come to uh, choose the femoral size in between uh, the component sizes, here you downsize your femoral component. When you downsize your femoral component, you are going to increase your flexion gap. This increased flexion gap will match the loose extension gap. And at the end, you are going to use a thicker polyethylene. So your aim is to achieve two to five degrees of flexion at the end of the procedure. You would like to intentionally leave these sorts of joint into little bit of flexion deformity. So when you come to the distal femur cut, it is three to four millimeter less than the implant thickness. You downsize your femur. You under reset your tibia, just six to seven mm. 
you have to reassess the gaps from time to time means like uh you do uh, suppose if you do your uh, tbr cut and extension cut you have to reassess your gaps at that stage either if you just start only with the gap balancing where you do first tbr cut reassess your gaps uh, and then take your call uh, and keep in mind that uh, no posterior release has to be done and sequential and guarded uh, medial lateral release only if it all required so there are other techniques which are also proposed like posterior capsular plications proximal and posterior transfer of the collaterals tightening of the extension gap using a thicker poly under resection of the bone under sizing of the femoral component using an augments for the distal femur and using a constraint processes so uh, usually when we deal with the severe recurvatum deformities you have to uh, use the uh, uh, high, uh, higher constraint implants so this is an algorithm suppose if you are dealing with an uh, rigid varus or valgus deformity uh, associated with recurvatum your preliminary medial or lateral release and under resection of tibia and the femur should work for you if you are uh, dealing with associated correctable deformity you will not require any more releases all you need to do is downsize your uh, resection uh, thickness if you are dealing with an unstable knee then you will require an highly constrained implants post operatively uh, you have to keep a pillow uh, below the knee joint so like i said this is in contrast to your flexion deformities where we used to tell that no pillow under the knee joint here you want to to intentionally keep a pillow under the knee joint so that you will end up with some amount of the flexion uh, deformity in next uh, couple of days and uh, in case with severe pre operative recurvatum where the recurvatum at the end of the surgery was closer to 0 degrees a long knee brace can be used while walking uh, for 2 to 4 weeks so there are complications like it can lead to recurrence of the recurvatum deformity uh, it can be uh, leading to the instabilities uh, aseptic loosening and loss of ability to ambulate in patients with especially polymyelitis so you have to identify this recurvatum whether it is neuromuscular or non neuromuscular you have to go for proper counseling of your patient need to have a thorough clinical examination anticipate what are the challenges you are going to have keep your cuts minimal both on the distal femur and the tibial side uh, try to use a thicker inserts downsize your femoral component ensure adequate soft tissue balances and avoid any sort of posterior releases so that's one video i have got about uh, distal femur cut revision using a gap balancing technique so uh, this this actually uh, in a gap balancing technique we always perform your tibia cut and the tibia cut should be perpendicular to the mechanical axis so this is a distal femur cutting jig which is having 5 degrees of valgus correction so you can see there are eight slots eight pin sides for the uh, jig uh, placement the fourth hole is considered to be a neutral one whichever we used for the flexion gap so here i am uh, using uh, actually i balanced already in my flexion so now you are putting this jig such a way that it it fits on one side in the distal femur resection block and other flatter surface will make contact with the complete tibia on the lower part now you can see some amount of recurvatum still persisting here clearly you can see the recurvatum in the knee joint so uh, already i had taken my tibia cut minimal now i am going to reduce my uh, distal femur cut so it is very simple here you just take off that uh, guide femoral guide yeah femoral guide i'll just show that one once you are taken now you slide it distally means you are going to choose the fifth hole when you slide it distally the amount of distal femur cut you are going to get is lesser than what was previously planned suppose if you slide it uh, proximally you are going to increase the amount of distal femur cut which you usually choose in flexion deformities so here it is very easy way to assess your flexion gap see i have reduced my distal femur cut now i can uh, see hardly any recurvatum there so even before you have 
completed your preliminary cut, you can decide whether you have to take an additional cut or undercut uh, with this gap balancing technique. Thank you. Yeah, good. <clears throat> well done, Ratnakar. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, recurvectomy is one of the worst things that can happen. Um, Post-op also it can happen. And uh, recurvectomy management is very difficult because the posterior capsular structures are all very, very uh, loose and uh, stretched out. Whatever you do, recurvectomy brace, whatever you do, revisions, uh, end of the day, the results are not good. Um, my patients in my 25 years of experience, other than the infections, the worst thing is recurvatums, uh, which happened over the years. And uh, all of them are very unhappy. So every knee replacement, you should see that you should never lose, keep the joint loose or in recurvatum. Especially in rheumatoids, they will stretch and worst possible mm -hmm. com long term complications. Yeah, any questions? Sir, your preferred implant of choice PS, CR, or CS in primary recurvatum I think I'll go with the PS or probably highly congruous knee. Like buccal purpose. Yes. Any questions, guys? Where are our fellows? I can't see anybody's video. I told number of times all the fellows should switch on the videos. So there's one question, sir. Um, in long-standing FFDs, any role of EMG or NCV? Narrow conduction studies in long-standing FFDs. Is there any role? Why? Why? There is no role. No role. No role. But long-standing FFDs, you have to see the Doppler. 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 Yeah, vascular study, yes. Not yeah, very important. Not, not, no condition. <laughs> Sir, please elaborate the technique of posterior capsule out me. Posterior capsule out me. I'm sharing that PowerPoint again. Posterior capsule out me video. Oh, video, I don't know. I'm a little confused. Basically, like in extension, posterior capsule, in extension. you put a laminar spreader on both sides and uh, use the diathermy and cut the capsule on the tibial surface or on the tibial side, not on the femoral side. Yeah. Cut on both sides from the midline and stick to the bone and see the twitch of the foot. Yeah. And in the more you have to stop when the fat protrudes into the joint. That means your capsule is completely detached. Yeah. Go, go Ratnagar. Sir, just I uh, want to add one point, sir. Here in flexion contractures, your posterior capsule is thickened out. So unlike your normal cases where your posterior capsule, once you do your use electrocautery, immediately you will uh, you will expose your uh, fat pad. Here it is not that easily you will get that one because of the thickness in the uh, uh, capsule. So you can safely use your electrocautery. But only care is that, like sir said, it should be away from the midline. And preferably do it in extension so that you will have uh, more visibility. Close to the bone, you have to be. Yeah, TBL side. You have to be close to the bone. Right, any other questions? Sir, what all? Changes in upsizing and downsizing femoral component with respect to the 
implant. Uh, Gaurav, can you just clearly ask your question? Unmute yourself. Good evening, sir. Yes, Gaurav. Uh, sir, what changes does the upsizing and downsizing do to the component? I mean, the distal thickness increases and the posterior thickness increases. Post posterior, posterior. It, it depends on your referencing system. Suppose if you deal with an anterior referencing system, yes, whenever sir. you upsize your component, your flexion, flexion gap will come down. Come down. Okay, sir. Whenever you uh, downsize, your posterior cut increases. So your increases. flexion gap increases. So you your, should use the wrong word here. Uh, your distal size will never change. In change. Your, yes, sir. That that is what was confusing me, sir. Distal does never. not change. Yeah. Distal oh, never changes. Change. That's the whole point. So your, never size, change. your extension gap remains the same because your distal mm. cut remains the same. That's always same. standard. 9 mm or whatever it is. Okay, okay. sir. Here, sir. either if you subsize, it will come down. It will make it tighter. If you downsize, it will go up. It will make it looser. That's no, the whole sir. point of changing the size. You're not changing yes, the gap, but you change the flexion gap. Okay. Even posterior. In posterior doesn't change. Implant thickness yeah. doesn't change. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello. Good evening, sir. Yeah, Jagsir. Tell me. Yes, sir. Sir, in the in one slide there is the shifting of VMO uh, distally and laterally to tie to deal with the extension lag, sir. Please explain. Mala elaborate that it is. In necessary in every case or every time with physiotherapy, the extension length will go? No, no. That is only in case of a severe flexion deformities for a longer duration. The deformities oh. which we are dealing with normal FFD of 10 degrees, 15 degrees, uh, they don't require any require. Uh, additional changes in a capsular closure, okay. which has a long uh, deformities where there is an uh, extensor mechanism is very loose there because of the stretching. Only in those conditions, you need to slide it distally and laterally. Okay. Thank you. Pull-out yeah. has to be done with patella inverted or inverted? Pull-out, patella inverted. Inverted. Yeah, yeah the sunshine fellows, you are understanding the concepts. Yes, sir. Yeah, good, good. good. Right. Uh, I think we're uh, done with the questions. I just have a small. So, if if we're going as per the schedule, next week is supposed to be partial knee and uh, anterior medial. Doctor Adesh uh, just had a word with Ashok, sir. Huh? Next week, because of ROC, their own. I was just about to ask that question. Yeah. Should we postpone to the following week because of ROCs? Yeah. 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 Sir has already taken a call uh, that next week we are not going to have this meet. Sure. I was literally going to ask that same question. Yeah. So, um, 26 Jan is okay. It's uh, Republic Day. It's okay, right? We can still go ahead, right? Uh, Ashok, sir. I won't be there on 26th. Maybe because uh, I got my old students reunion. Oh, right. Okay. It's a public holiday. We'll fix a day and inform on the group. How about yeah. 18, one day before? Like, like speak, can we put it on Thursday instead of, I mean, Wednesday instead of Thursday? Ashok sir, is that okay? Yeah, definitely. No problem. Uh, Ashok sir is not there, I guess. Maybe Neeraj uh, sir is... I will discuss it, sir. We can have it, it on yeah, Wednesday. Okay, okay. Just, we'll just, take it. Yes, sir. All yes, of sir. Us, just keep, a, keep an eye on the group so that in case there's any change. Next week, we won't have on Thursday. We may prepone it to Wednesday instead. That is yes. 18th of Jan. And I think next week we're speaking on AMO as anterometer osteoarthritis and partial knee replacement. Um, do you want me to show, uh, I mean, give a brief presentation and also show the video of the procedure? Yes, or, yeah, you should. You should okay. because many of people do not know. So let them have a feeling of what, what partial knee looks like and how, how would do you do it. Sure. Okay. We'll do that. Okay. So uh, if Ashok sir and okay. all are okay. We'll pre to 19th then instead of, I mean, 18th instead of 19th. Yeah. We'll check yeah. and put it will coordinate. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Great you, talk, Ratnagar. Very important topics today. Thank you. Thank you, Ratnagar. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
Okay, good night, Anna. Good night. Good night, all. Thank you, all. Thank you, sir.